All right, okay, um, uh, we're live. So as you, if this is the first time you've been to one of these uh, product tanks, you're probably thinking, man, these guys have got it sorted out with the lighting, um, it's taking away every wrinkle I have um, as we speak. Uh, two cameras, it's not? Um, and, um, uh, but we, we have, we're lucky to have Josh here, so uh, thanks to Josh, who's um, the AV geek who is experimenting with every piece of tech he can find. Um, to uh, bring this live stream to us. Um, so um, when we do Q&A and stuff, we're probably going to have Suhil running around with a, a mic to take questions which won't amplify, won't amplify your voice. So when you talk into it, it'll just sound like it does now, but the people on the live stream will actually be able to hear your question. So that's how that's going to work. Um, we've got, we're very lucky to have... Actually, who first I haven't done this for a while. First time people at this product tank? I won't make you do it this time. Okay, so still a few new people. So, so the the whole point of this product tank, we started it in 2015, and it was at the sort of cusp of when there was this real awakening of the role of product as a specialized leadership role, and this equal lack of understanding about what it meant, how you got into it, how you did it really effectively, and made an impact. And so we built this uh, meetup and this community that's now almost 2,000 people in just Wellington to ask ourselves how do we do it better, to share knowledge that we've had as, as people have gone through this journey and become uh, more experienced in it. And so we have not only people who are in product ownership, product management, CPO roles, but people in designer roles. We have CEOs, we have other executives who are interested in product. Um, a, a whole range of people come here and speak and contribute. So it's like it's become a really good hub of people interested in how you bring products to market, how you lead them effectively. So today we're really lucky because we've got Vidya, who's a, a returning Kiwi who spent, um, I don't know how long, but a long time in America raising a family and working and um, being a product leader and coach in America. And she's condensed a lot of that learning um, into a book that she's first, uh, her first book that she's recently published, Groundwork, which um, we were, there was a little stripe saying free giveaway, free books. Um, and so that's probably why most of you are here. We are still giving three books away, um, but we're going to give a bit of an IOU because we don't physically have the books here. COVID's made shipping a little bit tricky. Um, so what we're going to do is do a prize draw at the end. And so if you haven't put your name down on a blue bit of paper, is there anyone here who hasn't put their name down? On a All right, good. Um, so we're going to just pass that around the room, maybe just get, let them do it. So put your name down, put your name in the box, and we're going to draw out three lucky names um, at the end of it. So just stick around long enough for that at least. Um, and then we'll work out how to get the books to you when they actually arrive in the country um, after we've done that. So before we kick off, I'm just going to hand over to, to Zeng, who's going to say a few words. Zeng's head of product here at Raygun. Um, so Zeng, do you want to do your thing? Sure. Thank you very much for um, everybody to, uh, to attend this. It must feel a little bit strange for some of you who are returning from overseas. Welcome. Um, I'm the VP of product here at Raygun. Um, uh, just want to give a shameless plug for us. We are looking for a senior product manager. The link is right here, raygun.com slash careers. I'll pass it on to our uh, COO, Nick Stevens, who will give a little bit about health and safety um, in the office today. Yeah, I get the job of admin. So look, if there's an emergency, there's an exit behind you, there's a stairwell, and there's also an exit on the other side uh, past the kitchen on the left. Uh, for toilets this evening, uh, we do have female toilets, but they're through a locked stairwell, so we're just suggesting that they use the unisex toilet, which is just here. And for the males, there's a toilet just past the kitchen on the left. Uh, in terms of getting access to the floor, it's all locked down, so if you go down, you'll need to tell someone in advance so they can swipe you back up. So that's admin for me. If there is an earthquake, our uh, rendezvous point is down in the Bunnings car park. Okay, all right. So, um, Vidya, welcome to New Zealand for your first real life. Um, come and join me here because I think the video might get you about here. Okay. So, this is the first real life meetup it's, you've it's done. It's kind of surreal. I yeah. like, I'm like, these people are real, right? I'm just like dreaming this. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Vidya's been pr uh, sort of launching her book in the US, Boston, and a few other places. I don't know where. But I'm like in San Diego. Yeah. So, like, and doing it all virtually because all virtual. everywhere else in the world is locked down. So, yeah. yeah. So, be nice to her, you know, in your real selves. And um, I'm going to let you get into it. Thank you so much. All right. Big round of applause. Thank you, Tokes. Thank you. So, this is, this is really cool because I, I just got told 
um, Josh just told me, like, where in America are you from? So that just hurt so much. I'm a Wellingtonian, and if I sound weird, no one in America will ever mistake me from being from there. So just know that, that they know that I'm a Kiwi. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. It's, it's really exciting just to be in front of, of real people. Um, I want to tell you about Tokes for a second. Before I do that, um, you've probably seen this Slido before. Um, if you haven't, all you need to do is flick up your phone, stick your camera on this. Um, it's a really nice way. I know there's some people uh, out there virtually as well, um, which is how we do everything in, in the States right now. But if you could just flick it up, I'd love to see who, are, apart from product managers, uh, are in the room. Um, so Tokes, who I know has to disappear in a few minutes, but I just want a huge thank you for setting this up. Um, I met him a couple of years ago because I come home a couple of times a year and for the first time a couple of years ago, I was like, I want to know what the product scene is happening. And the first person everyone told me to go meet was, was, was Andrew. And immediately we just kind of, we hit it off. I think it's like when two product people like, meet and it was just like nonstop. And I just loved his story so much about being product in zero, just the, the experience and building a product culture that he's actually featured in the book. He's modest, he didn't say that, but he's actually in the book. There is an interview by zero. There's lots of names, but I'm so proud to have a Wellingtonian and a, and a New Zealand company in there. So thank you again. Okay, gang, so product manager mainly, a digital product owner. We've got six people, there's a lot more uh, I see. Can you, can you pop up your camera? Oh, cool. Domain, architect, end user, a BA, cool, a designer, awesome. Couple more. Look at that number. I can see people like popping up their phone. There's gonna be more of these. It's a really fun way of kind of just getting sort of something interactive, so, so please play. It's so much more fun when people do. Okay, awesome. So product manager primarily and some platform product managers. Um, what I want to do tonight is talk to you about the three pillars of product management, which are the core of what's in the book. And I want to start this talk actually by talking about some customer testimonials that we would all be proud to, to read of our products, right? The best company I've ever seen. Never have a home without one. Thank you for making this so simple. Those are customer reviews that every product manager I know would love to have. So let's meet the products behind these. The first is this little camera called Wise. Um, it's, it's a bit of a competitor to, uh, to, to, the, uh, to Nest. And what it says is like people, first of all, it's so simple, but look at the times they say, the number of times they buy one. This is a sixth I've purchased. Anytime you have love, and when you're talking about a product, you know you've got something right. The second one is this little Ecobee. And Ecobee is a tiny company, it's, it's Canada. Um, Amazon put some money into it a few years ago as a startup, and last year it became brand of the year in Canada, and now it's going to top this year in 2020 about a billion dollars in sales. So it's growing incredibly fast, and there's that word again. I absolutely love this thermostat. The third is USAA, and it's a big bank. It primarily serves the military. But I can tell you I know a couple of product people who work at USAA and the company culture that's dedicated to creating an amazing customer experience is why people call it outstanding and why there's so much loyalty. I can tell you I don't feel about my bank or my insurance company like that. Anyone know what those numbers mean? Just shout it out. NPS, ding, ding, ding. Um, so net promoter score, it's a metric that measures um, how much people will recommend the product to others. And if you don't use it, I could spend the next hour just talking about NPS. I love that metric. It's really simple. I know it's controversial, but what you need to know about this is a world-class NPS is about 60. So when you see scores of 80, 71, and 78, you know they're doing something pretty incredible. And if you're thinking, okay, they're all consumer products, it's easier, we hear this a lot, it's so much easier getting a great NPS when you're B2C. But here's a B2B company, it's called Gusto. It's a, it serves a small business for HR and payroll and an NPS of 75, like higher than world class. And there's that word again, love the experience. So as we're thinking about these products, you know, they kind of make it look easy, but we all know getting customer reviews like that, getting that NPS is so much harder than it seems. 
And it's not just us, the biggest brands in the world struggle with this. Anyone remember Google Glass? I bought one, like I'm, I'm not embarrassed. I kind of am embarrassed, I bought one. Um, my team like looked at the, the features, all the things that it promised. I worked for an insurance company at the time. We had all these grand plans because we believed Google about how we could integrate it and it was an epic failure. New Coke, I don't need to say anything more about that, right? It's crap. I still get PTSD from Windows Vista. I can't even actually look at that. Okay, so we'll just move on. This is really funny, Harley Davidson. So they decided that they were gonna release a perfume. And if you look at the ad, it's this guy with long flowing hair talking about Harley Davidson parfum. Now, I can tell you that they clearly didn't understand their core customer because it's not lasted very long. We actually try to go buy it um, on eBay and, and, it, and there, there isn't to be found. And the last one is, I'm ending on a bit of a sober note, uh, healthcare in America is abysmal um, <laughs> of many things, don't get me started, but there's been some incredible money put into healthcare systems and they've all been failures. So even with the biggest resources, with time, with money, with incredible talent, you can get this wrong. So how then do you build products that customers actually want? So usually I do this with my business partner, Heather. She's actually up there in, in Portland right now, so it's kind of fun seeing it. I need to send her that picture because that represents where we are right now. Um, we met at Intuit um, a long time ago. I spent 10 years running the TurboTax product experience. She ran QuickBooks. And since then, Oh, it's, it's cut out. Yep, I can. Is that better? Yeah, that's much better. Okay, sorry. I like to wave my arms around a lot. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Th on again? I can. Excuse me? You just wanted me to. Do you want me to take it out of this? How's that? Yeah, that's much better. Is that better? Yep. Okay, sweet. Okay, so I was saying we did a bunch of product jobs and four years ago, um, we wanted to create a product coaching company. So we created Product Rebels and in that time, we have coached over 100 companies from small all the way to Fortune 50. And in doing that, we discovered in coaching, there are certain core principles that we seem to go back to over and over again. And the absence of these core, what we're calling pillars, would be the difference between a product team failing and succeeding. And so that's why we wrote the book. Um, I'm so bummed, like Tokes told you, I had shipped a whole box to be here on time for you all. I was hoping to give you all a book, um, not just the draw, but um, DHL decided to cancel the shipment to New Zealand last week, um, but I will get them to you, okay? So put your names in, I will get them to you. So this is really what the talk is about, those core pillars of what makes products great. And so tonight I wanna go through how you lay the groundwork for your product team, what these three pillars are and how you can recognize them, and then just touch upon how to practice groundwork in your own team. So let's go back to the four products that we talked about right in the beginning, the, these, these beautiful ones with these incredible net promoter scores, and see what the things that they, plus the 100 companies that I talked about, what do they get right? Well, the first is they get super clear on the problem to solve. And I wanna talk about Gusto for a second, that B2B software for HR and payroll. So they focused so intensely on small businesses, which were underserved by all the big HR and payroll providers. If you're a small business, you don't want to deal with HR and payroll. You wanna deal with the business of running your small business. So what they did was they stripped out all the complexity of most of the big software and honed in on hiding complexity, making it super simple to do those tasks that were absolutely necessary. They knew exactly the problem to solve and they didn't vary from it. They didn't add features, they didn't make it more complicated, they didn't try and serve more, they've stayed honed in. The second is that they knew their customer inside and out. Now, one of the interesting features about Gusto is that they have um, a way that you can write a personal note with every paycheck. Now that's kind of insane for any size company, 
But for Gusto, knowing their customer, this became this huge delighter amongst small businesses because they loved it. They want to keep the family of employees happy. They want to keep the, the, the intimacy of their, t uh, their team. So this note, this feature was clearly designed for that customer. And the third, and this is a bit more nuanced, and this is where I really want to get into, I'll show you what this looks like as the pillar. They connected a customer to the problem and to the needs. And a lot of the time, a lot of companies jump over this. They go straight from a problem and a persona, and they jump straight into building software, building features, building a backlog. Connecting this to needs is that third part of the pillar, which is critical and is often the difference between success and failure. Now, I told you about the three things when it happens when they get it right. When what we see when it, it's not working, what we did when we came in and diagnosed product organizations is that we'd find that product teams were overwhelmed. The ideas were coming from everywhere, whether it was from sales or accounting or customer service or your boss. It was really hard to say no because you weren't sure what you were saying yes to. Everything went. And what that led to was way too many priorities. There's like way too much to do. One client had a backlog of over a thousand. And you know, that might not sound so terrible, but their throughput was about 20 items on their backlog every quarter. So you imagine the sort of the depression, like the iceberg of things they would never ever get to and they just kept piling on. A lot of teams we found were stuck in opinion-based debates. And so it was a matter of, I think this and I think that. And it was like verbal warfare in these teams and in these customer teams. Whether you were with sales or accounting, it all became the last person who spoke for the customer or the hippo, right? The highest paid person in the room. That's who won. And when that happened, like just decisions kept getting overturned. So your team would be going off in one direction. And now I'm going to speak purely as a product person. Um, you've got your team, you've described the strategy, you've described what you're going to do, and then you've got to come in and say we've changed direction. It's really disheartening. And the last piece of this is you get unhappy customers, right, which is kind of the, the worst of all. Um, you get bad customer feedback, you get bad NPS scores, and you just feel like you're fighting a losing war. So those are the things, and I promise you there's no more bumming out. Th this is the kind of stuff that we saw. And so I just want to actually hear, anyone experience any of this in the last 30 days? Like, yeah, I, I see hands, awesome. I, 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 I don't want to pass the microphone yet, so can you just like ch tell me? You can ch check any one of these. And for those of you virtually, please play along. You can, you can also hold up your phone, it works on the QR code. And let's just see what, what happens. I'll just give it like a few seconds. Debates, okay. Prioritization. Confused teams. No, that's really hard as a product person to look at that. Okay, prioritizations and debates. Looks like those two are going neck to neck. All right, so I've got an answer for you how to avoid all this. You ready? Let's talk about the three groundwork pillars. Now, before you say, wait a minute, she's talking about problem, persona, and needs, we deliberately chose those names because the last thing our product world needs is for us to come up with something else to, to have to remember and to define. So we're going to stick with what we know. The key is the way we describe it. I'm going to talk to you about how to converge on the right problem, how to make your persona actionable so that you, as a product leader, can actually make decisions with the customer in mind and then individualize needs and I want to show you how to focus so that you can avoid all those opinion-based debates because you're logically taking people through why you're doing something. So the first, convergent problem statement. So let's start here. Um, so I'm sure this is very, very familiar to you. Like as problem solving people, we like going straight to building something. It's natural. Our development teams love building stuff as well. It's fun to go think about features to build. That's what we like to do. We like launching. So I know I'm dragging you all the way back to this challenge statement, and that's what we need to do as product leaders. We need to come back and think about the problem. Now. At Intuit, we used to call this go broad to go narrow. 
in design thinking. It's often called convergent, divergent thinking. And a lot of product people call about this problem space and the solution space. I kind of don't care what you call it. Um, what I do care about is that you think broadly about the problem before you pick something very deliberately on, and you focus. So let's just actually talk about the definition and then I'll bring it to life. A convergent problem statement expresses the difficulty your customer is dealing with with no attempt to address, address a solution. This is the hardest thing to do. We want to put solutions in there. We want to put features. We want to talk about how we're going to solve the problem. Convergent problem statements are about only the what. So let's talk about, as an example, a home thermostat. This one looks a lot like the one I have at home. Um, I actually don't know what any of the buttons down below mean. Um, I've never used them. I use the up and down, and they're a pain. I actually have two, so I'm doing this twice, upstairs and downstairs. So imagine that we're a product team, and we take a look at this, and we're like, well, this is antiquated. This is stuck in the 80s. We can do better. And we come up, and this is a lot of the way that teams work. We come up with what we think is a good problem to say, solve. There are currently no home temperature systems that are easy to use, okay? They have simple bold numbers, so let's just actually make it like really easy to use for customers. Ease of use is a number one design feature that product teams tell us. And they allow the user, let's bring us into IoT, let's make it sexy, uh, control temperature and humidity via their smartphone, okay? So here we go. We're a product team, we got given this as a charge, and a company out there did exactly that. They took that problem statement and they built this. Now, it looks simple, it looks attractive, it's got some big bold numbers, and by the way, it connects to your smartphone. But guess what customers said? They love the idea, but it almost resets itself and changes the temperature settings all day long. This thing ended up costing me money. There's nothing worse than waking up in the middle of the night in a sweat. Clearly, the product didn't work. Now, why? So let's go back and think about some of the problems that might have existed if we just talk problems and no solutions. The first is, let's just talk about the display. Like We'll make it simple to read. We're talking to customers. They say they want different settings for different parts of the week. Maybe they want to look at it remotely. They're spending too much on energy. Now, this is interesting. This is starting to get to a problem we haven't heard before. They don't want the defaults. They want to be able to override them. And... If you trust me in saying through conversations with customers, we start hearing a theme. The root cause is it's never the right temperature in the house. This has got nothing to do with the way it looks. It's got nothing to do with connectivity. It's about what the customer is actually experiencing as a problem with no attempt to address how we're going to solve it. So if we start with that, and now let's redesign the problem statement. And say homeowners have multiple cold and hot spots. They find it annoying and confusing figuring out how to set temperatures. So they constantly change them manually. What we've done in a problem statement is that we've described the actual problem a customer has. We've honed it in to the emotion that they're feeling. This is a critical part of the problem statement. You want to know how you're, what you're addressing, how people feel. And we've provided a root cause of this problem with no attempt to talk about a solution. There are a million ways that we could go and we could figure out how to address this problem. When we do that, and now let's take back a look at Ecobee, which is like growing like crazy. What they did was they didn't just design a home thermostat to put on the wall. The wall. They created these tiny little gadgets that you actually placed in different parts of your home. And that's what sensed the temperature. So then you get statements like from customers, it reads the temperature in my living room and it ignores the temperature of where the thermostat actually is, which solves the problem. There are no longer any hot and cold spots in your house. That's what focusing on a core problem does for you. It allows you to unleash creativity. It allows you to go into that solution space with primarily and solely the problem that the customer actually has. Okay, so that's the first pillar. Um, this is a, a, a well-known um, 
advertising marketer, um, Theodore Levitt. He was a, a professor from Harvard from the 50s and 60s. He talked about people don't want a quarter inch drill, they want a quarter inch hole. It's a well known saying. It's 2020. Um, we talk about what do they want to use that quarter inch hole to do? That's what we should be asking as product people. That's great for marketing. We need to go a two or three layers further down. So shameless plug for the book. We take this example and we'll show you what you can do with this, pulling it down to all of the different things that you could do with a quarter inch hole. And I said that and it sounds kind of weird, but I promise you it's not weird. It's actually, it's a lot of fun. So tell me um, if you're thinking about like what problem your, your customer, do you really know what problem your customer is solving? And let's play again. Like uh, I'm going to grab a sip of water. You play, please. Uh, tell me as you think about your backlog, as you think about your roadmap, how many of them are based on problems and not features or solutions? Not many. Okay, some, cool. That's what we tend to see, okay? Not many, okay. Some. Cool. So we've got basically um, about half and half. So, so doing this will work wonders for your team. If you do nothing else, if you, do, if you just take one pillar, do this. Go back and rewrite every single priority that you have as a problem and then see that change the way the dynamic of your team works. And it's interesting because we've never done this with a team that everyone comes back with the same problem statement. They're always different. So it's a great conversation. All right, so let's talk about actionable persona. Let's move to the second pillar. Um, persona is such a horribly overused and hated word. Like I don't think I've found something in the product world that's hated more. And it's because of stuff like this, right? You kind of get these personas that you paint up on the walls and there's this like nice smiley, like stock photo guy. And I, I don't know, like he attended 14 events. Um, I don't know what association events are, but he didn't attend none of them, if that's helpful. Um, he's a number one CEO VP. I mean, as a persona, this is absolutely and completely useless. But in so much of when you call out persona, that's what people drag out and show us. Something they never refer to. Here's another example, Helena. So she's a head of HR. And I don't have no idea what skews female means, but, but there you go. Um, and she's got a calm demeanor. I don't know what I would do with that for a product. I mean, do I want to make it like look like spa? Do I want to use certain colors? I mean, again, completely useless for a product person to know what to do. What we want to tell you is most of the time, personas act like everyone's exactly the same. They treat people like a, this broad paintbrush and everyone is Brent and you do nothing with it. And that's why customers don't recognize themselves in the products that you want them to buy. So our defin definition is it's a living archetype of your primary target customer representing similar behaviors and characteristics. But here's the key. You need to actively use it. Your decisions, your product decisions, you go back to your persona and you use them to say, make a trade off and talk about what you're going to do. This is your card when you get to those endless debates. It's not about what do I think, it's what does my customer think. And that's who you bring into your product discussions. So let's see what this looks like with Gusto. So remember, this back to our B2B example, um, let's talk about the, the payroll leader. Um, small business, this is, we're only talking about a few people in this company, and we can start with demographics, but really the, the key for making it actionable is to think about psychographics. And what I mean by that is really getting into, so what does she care about? How does she make decisions? What keeps her up at night? What does she wish for? These questions, we have a set of templates that I'll show you how to get to later. You can download all of this for free um, and we'll show you the template and how to put it together. So there's a one page actionable persona. But, and, and one of the things we talk about in the book is to really think about these things called character trait spectrums. So when we go into teams, to try and get us away from demographics and into psychographics, it's useful to say, what end of the spectrum are they? 
Are they, do they love technology? Are they someone who's going to play and tinker and they want all the bells and whistles that you provide? Or are they technophobic? And you've really got to hide a lot of the complexity and intricacy from them. Are they someone who really likes control? They want to know exactly what's happening. They're a control freak. Or are they more hands off? Is this someone who delegates information? So critical to thinking about the design principles and how you think about your experience. Are they really data focused? Is it something that they need to have every piece of information? And we all know customers like this. It's like, give me all the data, I need to see it. Or is it really much more about efficiency and just give me that moment of time information when I need it? It helps you as you think about these, these ends of the spectrum to start shaping the core of who this person, how they live and breathe and think. And so the way to, to start is through the character trait spectrums and then it starts looking at like something like this. This is not a stock photo. This is not someone who's smiling at the camera and looks super happy. When you look at Jennifer, you can tell she's hard at work, she's focused, she's got a bunch of stuff around her. Our statements by interviewing a bunch of Jennifers really gets to the core. It helps us make product trade-offs because we're saying, she says, if it's not accurate, it doesn't go out. So how do we help with accuracy? How do we help her sign off on everything that she needs? I know what I'm doing, just let me get started. Clearly from an onboarding experience, you don't want 25 steps, you don't want hours of training, you want her to start immediately because she's got no time to waste. She manages all the finances, not just payroll. So we want the visibility that's much broader than just her core function. Again, remember small business, it's not compartmentalized. She works through lunch, doesn't have time, busy, busy person. And my boss counts on me for financial input. So you're starting to shape a picture of someone that clearly then allows us to talk about product trade-offs. What would Jennifer want? And, and you can have those discussions with your team. In B2B, it's not just the user. We all know that there is a buyer. So you need to think about who that buyer is as well. So if you're a B2C, you can get away with one or two. At Intuit, at TurboTax, um, we, I, I, I was there when we bought up the business from 500 million to 1.3 billion. We had seven personas. That's it, seven. So. I can argue all day long about what you do and how you can cut out the personas. You just need them to make product trade-offs. So Carol needs to be up to date on the numbers to know if she's making the commitments. Her buck stops with her. You can see what the sign-off process, how you can start thinking about how you would design your product and the features that Jennifer and Carol need. It's her first business, so she wants some reassurance here. Like maybe it's the first time she's ever run HR and payroll. Focus is sales. She needs data to make decisions. Here she is in her car. Again, the photo matters because we get a sense of how busy she is. She's on the road, she's making sales. We need to make a mobile application because that's what we understand that she spends most of her time on. All of these are giving us product trade-offs and product decisions. That's really what an actionable persona means. So when we get to Carol and Jennifer, this is a real person we're talking about. A lot of the time with teams, we ask them to use a picture of a real customer. Like don't go to stock for images, ask your customer, can I just take a picture? Use that because there's nothing better to bring your customer to life than using a real customer. Um, there's real attitude. This isn't soft coding it. This isn't telling you what you wanna hear. They're demanding certain things that your product must do. And there's real emotion behind it and very little demographics. Demographics are, are, are mostly meaningless apart from a few exceptions. So I think I've said this two or three times, but the reason it's actionable is that we want you to use it. We want you to bring it in and talk about Jennifer and Carol, what would they do? And then how do we make the trade-offs between the different priorities that we're talking about? I think this is the last one, last time I'll ask you to play. So are your personas actionable? Uh-oh, thanks for being honest. Okay, so I, that's interesting. I didn't realize personas were, that's a surprise. I mean, we, we've given this talk um, a bunch of times and mainly to US audiences, a couple in England. Um, 
but I'm, I'm really, um, that, that surprised me. I'd love to talk to some of you after about but why that is. Okay, so the last pillar, individualized needs. Okay, th and this is where it all comes together. And, and, I, and I love this section because to me, this is the core. It takes your problem, your persona, and it allows you to actually do stuff. So what is individualized needs? In an ideal world, we have one problem, we have one persona, life is simple. In the real world that every one of us lives in, you have a bunch of problems, you have a bunch of problems coming at you constantly, and you have a bunch of personas and customer segments, and marketing just wants more and more and more and to grow. That's reality. So we've got to think about a bunch of different people. But our job as product people is to make choices, is to make the call about what we're going to do. And so I want to talk to you about this idea about using individualized needs to do just that. So what it means is aspects of the problem for one particular persona that your solution must address. And this can be anything. It can be a task efficiency. It can be something to do with the environment. Um, it can even just be a baseline expectation. But what, what we're going to do is to capture all the needs. So let's see what this looks like. Let's bring back our little camera, like Wise. And we could say, shouldn't we build this that every single person, everyone lives somewhere, don't they want security? And that's a dangerous question to ask. But let's meet some people. Let's meet Jane first. Um, she's a nurse. She's in a rented apartment. She lives by herself. Peter is in the suburbs. He's got a family, travels a lot. And then the third person that we think is, is a target is Angie. She's a student. She lives in a rented house. And she's a bunch of roommates. But she's in a kind of like a rundown part of the city. So security is, is important. And what I want to talk to you is about how to associate needs by the individual. And so the way to do that first is to go see them in their home habitat. At Intuit, um, back to the last story about Intuit and TurboTax, we had this program called Follow Me Home. And we literally would follow customers home. I know it sounds super creepy. They let us. Um, and we watched them. We'd watch how they worked. We'd watch where they lived. Um, one of the one of the, the big projects that, that I was working on, my team was working on, was mobile, like doing taxes on your phone. And we wanted to see how people use their phones, how they used and where they put their receipts. The only way that, that we would find that out is by watching them. Because everyone will tell you aspirational needs if you ask them. If you survey them, if you put them in a focus group, I can guarantee people want to look good. They want you to look good. They will tell you what they think you want to hear. The only way that you really find out is by just hanging out and watching what they do. So you've got to observe. What that allows you to do is then to put yourself in their shoes and really empathize, which is a, just a core function of, of a product person. And so once you have, you've watched these different people, you can start actually creating a set of needs per persona, and then we can prioritize it based on what the business wants to do. So I want to like just keep on building this. Let's go, we went out and we met um, all those people, Angie, Jane, and, and um, all the, we went to their houses. And here's what we started to learn. And I'm not going to read all of these. Um, you can look at it. But I want you to get a sense of Jane. She's living in weather. Um, she's coming at home at all times. She's on a limited budget. Peter, we already know he's traveling, but he's got multiple different doors in his house and his kids are constantly leaving them open and he just like, he worries about them when he's on the road. He can also do pretty much anything when it comes to being a handy person. Angie lives in this crappy neighborhood. Um, her neighbor just got robbed and she just wants to have a sense of like, it's safe. She also cares about her animal and she has weather. One of the problems and one of the things that we see teams do is they take these and they start working on all of it. Or they work on the thing that the salesperson believes that they can sell first. And that's how all of these needs get jumbled in. But we as product people have decisions to make. We need to know where is this thing going to be mounted? How much is it going to cost? Do we need a remote access or not? Um, what is this going to look like? What are the capabilities this camera has? All of these questions come about. And the only way that we're going to make choices that are connected to a customer is to pick one. I had to bring Vista back for just a second because when you build all that stuff, this is what you get. And like PC Magazine, has anyone else got like PTSD from, from Vista? I know it's a long time ago, but 
you know, PC Magazine basically said turn these 12 things off immediately before you even use it. I mean, isn't that awful? Like, have a product that basically says turn half of it off because it's unusable. Don't bloat your products. So let's see what this looks like. We just talked about the set of needs that, that Jane, we talked about what we observed. Now let's talk about what the needs are. We're translating what we observed into a specific need. This is step number one. You have to translate. You have to move it from what Jane was talking about to saying there's a need to illuminate the entry. It needs to work in nasty weather. Peter, it needs to be, he needs to check when he's on the road. He needs to cover multiple areas. Angie needs to keep the entry well lit. If you've done the second step, the other temptation is to actually say, well, well this isn't common. Jane and, and Angie both need illumination. Maybe that should be number the first thing that we work on. Or this idea about remotely locking up. Um, both Peter and Angie want that, so maybe that's second. And then we've got another common element. We have to really make this camera hardy because it's going to work in really bad weather. Mistake number two, a lot of teams do this. They see commonalities amongst different personas and they think, let's just do that because it helps us serve more people. What it actually does, it, it helps you serve less because you're not really solving all the needs for an individual persona. So what we do want you to do is we want you to choose. The reason in this case that we chose Peter is that he's got multiple entry points. From a business perspective as a growing company, there's a revenue and there's a usage on the line here. Peter's got the money, he's got a big need, he's already concerned about leaving his family alone, he's going to buy more than one. So we chose Peter. Now that's not to say that we're leaving other people behind. So when you're talking to your sales and marketing people, you can talk about the fact that you've prioritized clearly for a single persona. You've individualized the needs so they solve everything that Peter is looking for. And maybe Angie's next because the fact that you've already built this important component allows you maybe to start marketing to someone like Angie who you're, you're playing on a core need for her to be able to lock up because she's left her place open, the neighbor just got robbed. You can see how just being focusing on one will start giving you a roadmap. It also starts giving you the ability to explain and to share and get commitment about why all the needs and all the features are focused on Peter. That's who you design for, that's who you can market to. Okay, so that's the core. It's like you choose a problem, you choose a persona, you select needs, and then you rinse and repeat this all day long. That's what we see in great product teams. This is how we come in and we restructure product roadmaps and product backlogs so that you are making decisions based on these three criteria. Last bit, last couple of minutes, just to, just to cover the practicing groundwork. So um, in the... What we just covered briefly right now was a convergent problem statement, a persona, and individualized needs. Um, those three are covered in the book. Um, and then we also talk about three practices. And the three practices are developing a hypothesis so that you can have a clear way of talking about what you're going to do. Um, conducting scrappy research because it's really important to talk to your customers. This isn't months, it's not weeks, it's not even days. We talk to you about how to do scrappy research in the matter of hours so that everything that you're doing is customer back. And then last is getting commitment because face it, we're not a vacuum. We've got to convince our dev team, we've got to convince our peers in sales and marketing, we've got to convince our boss. So how do you do that? How do you put this information together in a way that allows you to get that commitment and stop those opinion-based debates. Do all that, do those three things, and you will get better at making better products. Um, if you go to that address, you can download the templates. Um, they're all there. You, I think you just need to put your email in, and that's my email address if, you, um, if you'd like to get hold of me. I would love to hear from you. Um, the last thing I'll share is, until now, we've, we've very much focused on working individually with clients. Um, next year, we're trying something new. We're gonna put some public workshops together. 
and um, it's small groups. We're going to go through all three practices and all three pillars on your product. They're not case studies. Um, you have to do case studies in a place like this, but in the course, we actually work on your product. So at the end of it, you will have clarity around what to build, why, and who for. And, and you get to spend time with us, which, is, which I promise will be fun. It's 90 minutes a day, it's for one week, um, and um, we just put the code in. So hopefully if you're interested in joining, um, you, can, you can grab that. So um, the last piece is feedback. I know it's a gift. I would love to, as we open up for questions, um, I know we're drawing, uh, I think Totes said three names, but if you are interested in learning more, I'll also do a random draw from, from the feedback because I really value it and I want to give back. Um, so I'll take three names out of the feedback as well. So with that, thank you and I'd love to hear from you. Awesome, thank you so much for uh, pretty pretty insightful and I think um, I found it quite valuable how you talked about a lot of the details of personas and connecting a lot of those pieces together. So that was really, really awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that thank with us. Thank you. Um, I will, so if you haven't filled in your name and put it into that box for going in for the draw, that'd be great if you could do that. Um, we'll probably draw it towards the end of, end of this sort of quick Q&A session. Um, we'll now go into a QA and a session, so if you have questions, um, let me know and I can come around and um, give you the mic. There's also Q&As in the Slido. Oh, sweet. Um, so we can probably go through those while you sort of come up with some questions. <laughs> so the first one is, uh, what is your advice to a first-time product owner mm -hmm. starting at a big tech company? First-time product owner, is there, um, oh gosh, do they... Can they say, do, is there any product managers on the team or are they it, product owner and product manager? Who would like? Yeah, product team owner, direct report to PM. Direct report to PM? Yeah. And so how do you start working as a PO? Oh, just any tips to go from, specifically from startup land to founder, yep. founder hat, to, um, to going to a big tech company as a PO. Got it, got it. Um, so, so the biggest thing for PO, I mean, this is going to be a, a structure. And so learning what the structure of that dev team is and what the rhythm and how they get information. I think you'll find at a lot of big tech companies, there's very little connection from the dev team to the customer. It's almost invariably broken. And so you can have the biggest impact by bringing the customer in. I mean, you will be actually seen as like a godsend if you c just show them a picture, show them an interview, just bring the, and, and take five, 10 minutes um, of every, like even if it's once every two weeks in your sprint cycles, um, bring the customer into your meetings, get your development team because they are hungry for this. They just never, it's like, it's like we kind of set a hide our dev in a corner in, in a dark room and just get, expect them to code. But you will find that your engagement, um, the solutions that you come up with will just be incredibly like, they'll, they'll just blossom if you do that. And the only other thing I'll tell you is bring the business strategy. So I've said bring the customer in into your meetings. Also understand what your PM and the strategy of the business is and share that as well. Because in you saying it, you're gonna start talking about strategy. You're gonna be seen as someone who really understands the business and you're not just someone who's writing user stories, right? So for you personally, that's what I would do. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, next question. Uh, keen to understand your process for creating personas. Uh, my process, talk to customers. Um, so the first piece is, you know, I talked about developing hypotheses. When we're working on a new product, and I can actually give you, um, the other hat that I wear is I work with a lot of startups um, and I have a fund. I should have worn my Product Rebels t-shirt. I didn't pack it. So this is, we, we, I run a, um, a fund for, for female founders. And the way that we start is that we um, try to think about everything that we know about the customer and we put it in an I voice. So instead of saying this person, um, whether it was Jennifer or Carol, we say, I believe X, Y, Z to be true. And then we circle and prioritize those things that if they weren't true, would really hurt us. If they were proved to be false, 
They could be the undoing of our business. And then we go chase those. Because you don't have to prove out things that you already know. Don't bother. That's a waste of time. It makes you feel good, but really it's just like you've got better things to do. Go solve those hypotheses. Go prove them for things that if Jennifer really was never going to buy software, and that's what we're worried about because she's so entrenched in small business that she's so tech phobic that she's not actually going to make that purchase, it doesn't matter what we do, she's never going to buy. So I would go for those things that kind of like, you know, you know you've got the spidey sense to say, I'm scared that this might be true. Go chase that thing down. That's how you build a persona. Once you've proven those out, go get the template from the website and, and you can have a one pager and then stamp it on your wall, put it next to your dev team, put it next to your cubicle and see, look at her, him every day. Awesome. These are great questions. Is the persona then, is the persona like validated hypotheses yes. then? Did you just say? Yes, yeah, it is. Cool. They're all validated hypotheses. Yeah, sweet. Yep. That's exactly right. Um, another question on personas. So you mentioned you had seven personas added to it yep. um, for a very, very long time. Yep. Did you have more or less at any point and did you refine them over the years? Um, we had. We started off with a few more um, and then we... Um, I think when I first, when I started on the TurboTax, um, this is dating me now, but um, when I came in, we we're about like about 500 million, we had about, about 15 million customers, and we wanted to go into and expand into small business taxes. So we were very much personal taxes, right? We, we understood the simple tax, we understood the home owner, um, it's a lot about, the American taxes are just hideous, right? But we had two or three segments that we really understood about complexity. But then there was this whole other small business, and we argued that small businesses were very different, that a small business in this industry was very different from a tech industry, was very different from the, the hardware industry, and we talked ourselves into multiple different personas for small business. At the end of the day, when we tested out all of those, we came down and we eliminated all of them to come down to one, because the core needs of that particular small business was all the same. They might look a little bit different, they might smell a little bit different, but at the end of the day, what the core persona needed was exactly the same, what they worried about was exactly the same, and that's what we then defined. So yes, absolutely, do more and then test your hypothesis and narrow. Um, you don't have to start with one and then um, kind of drive yourself crazy. Just that's what the hypotheses are for. Awesome. Um, is there any questions on the floor? I've got a few more on Slido carry on um, when and how do you factor in how hard something is to implement yeah um, so when you're thinking about um, th there's there's a design te te design thinking technique I use for that so what you want in terms of your problem statements is as you think about broadly all the different problems that you could go after you can map them on a scale of how important it is to the customer and how difficult it is to build. And if you think about that axis, if it's really important to the customer and it's really difficult to build, you might think of it as strategic. If it's really important to the customer and it's pretty easy to build, you might think of that as pretty high ROI and go after it. And I can build out the rest of the quadrant. Not important to the customer, super hard to build, like why bother, right? So that's how you would plot, and that's how I would say, take all the problems that exist and use the customer lens first, put it on that two by two grid, get your dev team in there to help you with the high level difficulty. You're just eyeballing it, but it gives you a directional sense of where the important problem is. You might find that while the strategic, very important to the customer, very difficult, like years to build, is your goal, you can then draw a line to what problems are you going to solve that connect to that high level vision. That's how we break down the problems and build out a product roadmap. Uh, awesome, I've got two more here. Um, how do you encourage staying in the problem space mm -hmm. when pressure to be building something? Yeah, I mean, that's a really, <coughs> excuse me, when that happens and there's a ton of pressure to build something, you've got to choose. As a product person, you've got to buy yourself time to do the customer research. 
So what I would say is use your best intuition, your best guess, get a couple of the people that, that know the customer and the problem space well, and pick something to start with. While they're working on it, you've got to do the work behind it to say, actually, this is what we need to work on. Because a lot of the time, you're, you know, we would love to have more time in our design zeros or prior to that um, to really explore. Um, I know there's, there's a lot of work around exploratory space, problem discovery. We often don't have the luxury of time. So just pick. Pick something that's your best bet based on your best hypothesis. Do a little bit of scrappy research to confirm it isn't a crazy idea. Get started and do the work behind it. I mean, all as product people, we're always working like, you know, pretty significant um, time. I mean, this is, this is not an easy job, but it's also an incredibly rewarding one. So choose and then do the work behind it. I don't know if that's, that's a crappy answer, but it's the truth. Awesome. Is there any other questions? No? Yeah. Okay. Hello. Um, I guess just going back to your personas concept, uh, work at a team that I guess delivers internal products to a company, um, Zero, just down the road. Oh, yeah. Um, one of the things I guess I'm interested in is the value in having a shared understanding across all of the teams around those personas and sort of where that line lies. Um, Are guess. all the teams serving the same persona? I guess part of that is we don't maybe have <laughs> well-established personas mm -hmm. is the first part. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I guess the interesting part is there's a bunch of different teams that are perhaps trying to solve different problems for mm -hmm. the internal zero yeah. user base. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I guess. yeah, I would say yes. I think it's worth um, you getting together and thinking through is, is there the question you have? And I would start with a hypothesis. So as you think about this, do you believe there's one common or do you believe that we're actually solving for different personas within zero? And once you have that hypothesis, then I would do a little bit of a scrappy research and work. I'd build out the templates for one or more, and then I'd bring that to the teams. So what you're doing is you're throwing something, you're putting something up on the wall, and then you're having a conversation. A lot of the time when you just sit there and talk to people without anything, it becomes back to opinion-based, and that's what you want to avoid. So do a little bit of the pre-work, explain why you have the hypotheses that you do, and then have people push back on not you, and not the persona, but the hypothesis. Because then you can go ahead and test that as well. If they really, if you say it's only one, then they've got to prove there's another one. If you believe there's two, then they've got to prove there's either three or less. So that's how I would do that. Yeah, it's not, it's not that difficult. All the stuff um, we've done, because we know how busy product people are, everything is designed to take a matter of hours, not like, these are not month-long research projects. Awesome. Uh, any other final questions? Oh, there is one. Yeah, hi. hi. Thanks for your talk, by the way. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, so you had your three personas up as an example um, earlier, and you were talking about um, zooming in on the ones that had um, would most likely lead to the, the highest return for the organization. Yeah. Is there a, a, a market sizing element to that? Yeah, absolutely. You, can, you, can you talk us through some techniques you use in that market sizing space? Yeah, sure. I mean... If, if, you, if you just do your high-level TAMs, right, if you just think about sort of like w w what is the population, what is the likelihood to buy, because at the end of the day, that's what you're putting together, right? Product market fit is no more than is there an important enough problem that someone is willing to pay for? And so if you've said there is, then you can do a quick sizing in terms of like, you know, how many potential buyers are there? How, d how expensive it is it for you to get to them? Um, because it could be a huge market, but it's going to cost you a small fortune to market to them. Um, and so maybe you don't start there. Maybe with that sort of sizing plus accessibility, you are triangulating those figures to say, this is the right place to start for our business, given our current funding and given our ability to reach those customers. So that's the way that you would make that argument. So we said Peter because we knew that he was going to buy more. It's kind of a case study. We, we, we made this up, but we based it on um, exercises that we do all the time with teams, which is let's go find out what the business priorities are. So the last piece of this um, in terms of triangulation is, is your business trying to grow? Um, is it focused on retention? 
Uh, are you thinking about revenue? Mm -hmm. There's a real focus to increase it. So whatever your business metrics are, that will also help you size and pick the right market. Yep. Yep. Some very last question. Yeah. Uh, there's one that's just snuck in. Uh, it's easy to get lazy when working for customers who have to use you <laughs> rather than choose to use mm -hmm. you. Any key persona aspects to keep in mind for those customers? Yeah, if they have to use you and they resent it, um, they're just waiting to leave, right? They're waiting to fire you. So don't get complacent. I think what you want to do is that's where something like an NPS is quite useful because when you ask how likely are you to recommend this product to others and if you come back, the score is, is sort of irrelevant for NPS. It really is why, right? That gives you the direction. So you need to be on top of your product. I hope you want to always delight your customers and be scared if, if they have to use it because it does put you in that place of complacency. And that's where I think building in a product metric, having those conversations, understanding where your customer is, will really help you make the right calls. And even if it's put on hold, it might be just something as simple as communication. You might be able to pump this completely to your marketing or sales or account team just by giving them information. You as a product leader may do nothing. You may choose to build nothing because they're actually not a customer base you want to invest in. And you're not going to get any more revenue by putting more features but you still want to understand what drives them and what makes them happy. So, so do the information, then make the choices about what to do. It's, it, half the time, it's not building anything. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was a really amazing Q&A. Uh, we're now to the next most exciting part. <laughs> <laughs> um, would you like to do the honours? Why don't you? Oh, sure. I won't pick my name. Um, Steve Williams. Awesome. Sweet. Okay, I just need your details here. Why don't you pick one? <laughs> That's not me as well. Katie? Katie's. Katie? I think it's your Katie. I just need your details. Yeah, cool. Yeah, this is good. Sweet. Awesome. If you all give me your... Uh, um, just pop over to give me your name, your, your address. Um, I, I don't know exactly when because I can do nothing about shipping right now, but I will promise I will get them to you. And I'm going to send Andrew Tokes um, a bunch as well, so um, he will have a few copies as well. Thank you all so much. It's like such a pleasure talking to fellow Wellingtonians and product. I mean, I just never thought I would. And it's so much more fun being with real people, <laughs> I've got to say. It's like, it's so cool. Thank you very much. Cool, that's a wrap and pizza's also here, so all right.